Hello, I'm so happy to be able to present uh, virtually at the Amos conference this year. My paper is on the long lasting implications of 19th century woodwind characteristics. Though there is, of course, some variation, the gendered characteristics of woodwind instruments drawn from diverse times and places in Western art music demonstrate first a palpable shift from masculine to feminine, and then striking similarities even between the early 19th century and today. These characteristics continue to be extremely common, and the associations and their lasting ramifications often remain unexamined by those perpetuating them. In an 1851 treatise by Gassner, the sound of the clarinet becomes explicitly gendered as a full round female voice. For Rockstro in 1890, the consummate ease and elegance of the flute meant that owing to the gracefulness of this attitude, the flute is so peculiarly well adapted for ladies. Samuel Adler's orchestration manual, originally published in 1982 and updated in 2002, stresses the importance of matching instruments and roles psychologically as well as musically before portraying the flute, oboe, and clarinet in feminine terms. And surely Bach and Handel would have objected to the statement in Walter Piston's 1955 orchestration manual that agility does not seem to be suitable to the double reed tone. This is a remnant of particularly 19th century beliefs, heavily influenced by Berlioz's claim that the feminine oboe was ineffective and absurd if given a more active melody. A closer look at the portrayals of musical and extra musical characteristics of these instruments can reveal ways in which this narrative has been perpetuated on very little evidence. In the 18th century, the flute, oboe, and clarinet were masculine instruments. Flautist Johann Georg Tromlitz advises that a flautist should both try to achieve a steady metallic singing even sound and try to achieve only such strength as is healthy and masculine. As late as 1838, William Gardner described a new instrument called a clarionet, which had a fiery tone and was better adapted to lead armies into battle. Yet the early oboe was also majestical and stately and not much inferior to the trumpet, as well as brave and sprightly, and this characteristic held during the 18th century. Descriptors often reflect those of an ideal courtly man, while also recalling military power, and they associate instruments with a range of moods and emotions. This perhaps reflects the perception, prevalent before and throughout the 18th century, that instruments could frequently be substituted in music without any significant effect. In orchestral works from the first half of the century, and even more so in solo and chamber music, where acceptable instrumentation often included all treble instruments, from the violin to the recorder to the traverse flute to the viol, the character of the piece was separated from the character of the instrument. So the oboe, for example, could easily be seen as majestic, military, and charming by these writers. In many cases, romantic instrument conceptions, like romantic characteristics more widely, function as reactions against 18th century principles. As part of this, during the 19th century, European society experienced an increasing polarization of and preoccupation with gender and gender roles, and upper woodwinds became not just feminine, but female. In earlier periods, we see a difference in sex that was more a quantitative than qualitative matter, and a well-populated middle ground between the usual sexes was broadly acknowledged. But the 19th century middle class worried that men were no longer men and that strong women were causing emasculation. And this had a profound impact on conceptions of woodwind instruments, as increasingly feminine woodwind instruments increasingly became a way to reinforce their players' masculinity. Woodwind instruments are not alone in this. The soprano voice moved from a duality of femininity and heroism, as in the form of the operatic countertenor and castrato, to a solely feminine trait. And perhaps the most well-known instrumental gendering of this period is the violin's transformation, well before Man Ray's anger's violin, into a woman's body, seduced and sometimes injured by her male player. Though these in Bridges are from the early 20th century, similar textual descriptions appear from Paganini's lifetime and throughout the following century. 
1829 review from the Allgemeine Musikalische Zeitung describes Paganini as such. He seemed to be striking his instrument like the unhappy youth who, after conjuring up the image of his murdered mistress, destroys it again in a fit of amorous rage, then once more seeks to revive it with tears and caresses. This relationship between performer and instrument appears more widely, though. Lavoie writes that flute concertos were, in the 17th, 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, the most gallant tribute that a most devoted lover could give to his mistress. Not content to play their instruments, the virtuosos of the 17th century added to the ravishing sounds of their flute the charms of their voice. Who here is the mistress? the audience of the piece treated to the beautiful sound of virtuosic flute playing, or the flute itself being wooed by its player and sweetheart. The latter seems suggested by the textual emphasis put on the word ravishing, and the emphasis on that particular word also calls to mind Paganini and his seduced, beloved, tormented violin. So what we see is that in the 19th century, a combination of changing tastes, philosophies, and instrumental sounds led not only to increasing connections between specific instruments and gendered characteristics, but also to increasing distinctions between instruments and increasing ties between instrumental and compositional qualities. Further, although the transformation became began early in the 1800s, descriptions of woodwind instruments after the 19th century gender switch remained very static across nearly 200 years of the 19th and 20th centuries. There is no significant difference, for example, in the concentration of gendered remarks between the mid 1800s and the mid 1900s or in the genders assigned to instruments. These remarks also remain consistent across large swaths of otherwise relatively disparate Europe. The discussion of associations between gender and instruments is common in ethnomusicology, where scholars like Veronica Doubleday categorize gendered relationships between performers and instruments, including instrument player relationships where the masculinity of the instrument reinforces the masculinity of the player, and those where the masculinity of the player relates in a romantic, sexual, or controlling way with the female instrument. However, these relationships are also common within the texts of traditional musicology, as we see with Paganini and Lavoie. This latter relationship, the trope of female instrument and male player, is one that primarily applies to woodwind instruments in Western art music, but both relationships are relevant to woodwind instruments, particularly when examining the change in perception from the 18th century to the 19th century. Schubert, writing in 1806, as you see at the bottom of this slide, claims that bassoon playing demands the fullest breath and such a sound and masculine embouchure that only few people are fit physically to play it in a masterly manner. While by the 19th century, in contrast to Tromlitz's healthy and masculine flute, we have Rockstro, and as we already saw, the consummate ease and elegance, which means that the flute is peculiarly well adapted for ladies. Doubleday describes how one effect of male dominance over musical instruments is that the very image of a woman playing an instrument may be seen as weird, awkward, or laughable. The discussion of which instruments were suitable for female players, in fact, well predates the 19th century switch in instrumental identity. Concern over appropriate physicality for female instrumentalists appears even in ancient Greece. Athena is said to have invented the aulos, but as Heather Hadlock explained, she cast it aside when she realized how playing it would distort her face and compromise her dignity. Male players need not be concerned with this. In 18th century Europe, the harpsichord was seen as suitable, in contrast to wind instruments such as the oboe, described in a 1770s book for young ladies as too manlike. We see here both a concern over female presence and a description of wind instruments as masculine rather than feminine. This concern was not was also not limited to wind instruments. Uh, to 18th century theorists, the cello violated a proper female decorum by uh, because of the suggestiveness of its embrace-like hold, and this continued even in the late 19th century. Scholars like Rita Steblin often concentrate on the fact that during the 19th century, more and more instruments gradually became accessible to female players, but this accessibility remained highly restricted even well into the 20th century. 
This mirrors the tenacious gendering of musical instruments themselves. As discussed before, 19th century gendering, gendering remained prevalent for much of the 20th century and still impacts current conceptions of instruments. Though this discussion of decorum centers on female performers, not female instruments, this still resonates deeply with descriptions like those of Berlioz. And forgive me, I'm gonna move on for this slide. I'm happy to put it up during questions. Uh, but for Berlioz, the oboe is an instrument of naive grace, sentimental delight, or the suffering of weaker creatures. And its little bittersweet voice becomes quite ineffective and absurd. A march melody, however direct, however beautiful, however noble, loses its nobility, its directness, and its beauty when given to the oboes. Indeed, in solo music and in operas themselves, the oboe is often deeply associated with tragic operatic women. Uh, Gluck's Eurydice, Iphigenie, Alceste, and Armide, Wagner's Elsa, Freya, Sieglinda, and Brunhilde, Verdi's Amelia, Beethoven's Leonora, all these are represented in their operas by the oboe. Simultaneously, though, the oboe marches through Beethoven's symphonies and transforms Verdi into virtuosic fireworks in hundreds of Italian opera fantasias. And again, these descriptions of the oboe are markedly different from those of the previous century. The bassoon has a low range, which means that it is not feminized, despite its sweet, more subdued, but expressive higher registers. And instead, the clarinet's ability to mimic a female voice in range and volume becomes Berlioz's lonely virgin, and the oboe's ability to accompany sopranos becomes Guichon's description of the oboe as a young girl with feminine softness and secret charms, her palpitating heart and implicit link to the hysterical woman brought under control by a man, here a male player. At a bird's eye view, we overwhelmingly see range-based characterizations, often just an elaborate fleshing out of the literal connection between instruments and voice parts, and these show how artificial some of these associations and limitations are, and how basic others are. The clarinet was associated with adaptability and a wider range of characteristics than other woodwind instruments, reflecting its literal wide range. It is described as the mezzo-soprano sturdy and rich, connecting the clear soprano of the oboe and the husky-hued tenor of the bassoon. Others emphasize the clarinet's dark, menacing, and dramatic lower register. It may be that this adaptability causes the clarinet's androgyny of description. But how different is the clarinet from the oboe, for example, in suitability for a variety of effects? The clarinet's dynamic range from an inaudible pianissimo uh, to a trumpet like fortissimo is greatly praised, and certainly the clarinet can play more quietly than the oboe. But why then is the oboe associated with a gentle and soft feminine music, given the clarinet's ability to play the same notes? Because of the lack of gentle or soft feminine music in opera, which is not tinged with poignant sadness for the oboe? And then why is the clarinet not seen as poignant or sentimental, except perhaps by Berlioz? Because the oboe is overwhelmingly used as an instrumental indicator of these emotions for operatic women. The characteristics of the instruments are derived from the music in which they are used, which in turn is derived in some senses from the descriptions of instrumental characters in orchestration treatises. This is impossibly circular logic. These characteristics do not have clear antecedents, and later descriptions in particular draw upon previous musical examples, which are then described as arising from previous associations. And at the same time, these descriptions occur in the same kinds of treatises that contain this 1945 portrayal of an oboe's inner monologue from a German orchestration book. I stand on my rickety balcony and cut the darkness with my absurd longings, the envy for young flutes seething within me, if only it were a lie, after the comfortable self-righteousness of the chubby-cheeked clarinets, if it were stupidity. I long to go beside myself, beyond myself. Oh, I am sickly. Hardly a clear and straightforward depiction of instrumental qualities. But how do we get from this rickety balcony to today? 
Doubleday rightly claims that the relatively relaxed situation of Europe, where older gender codes about musical activity have partially broken down, masks a strong history of institutionalized male professionalism. She goes on to cite the delayed entry of women into the Vienna Philharmonic. The history of institutionalized masculinity is beyond contest. However, the writing on and treatment of woodwind instruments well into the 20th century seems to belie this masking. It is undeniably true that instrumental performance is broadly acceptable for female players at this time. Yet we have seen lasting resistance to accepting women widely as musicians. The very instance that Doubleday cites, the Vienna Philharmonic accepting its first female instrumentalist in 1997, emphasizes, emphasizes the way in which the situation is still shifting. The Czech Philharmonic also accepted its first female instrumentalist in 1996, and in 2007, Vienna still only had one female orchestra member. Despite obvious diversification, in many ways, the default musician is still a man. A survey in 2014 by composer Subi Rahman of the top 20 American orchestras revealed that gender bias was still heavily present. 91% of the conductors were male, 95% of the harpists female, 72% of bassoonists and 97% of trumpet players were male. And while violinists were 59% female, concert masters were 82% male. This is neither a scientific nor a comprehensive survey, but the numbers are still both shocking and unsurprising. Studies of gender bias in band instruments are not uncommon, but also remain fraught. A 2009 study suggests that peer pressure is the dominant force in pushing students towards gender aligned instruments, concluding that music teachers are likely to avoid gendered associations while suggesting instruments to students. However, a substantial majority of undergrad students in my introduction to Western art music class this year reported pressure experience from both instructors and peers in primary and secondary school to choose appropriately feminine or masculine instruments. Female woodwind players are no longer rare or socially unacceptable, but the many gendered associations detailed above have continued in more or less obvious ways to the present day. Claims like that of Elliot Carter, who describes instruments as having built-in character structure, structures, so to speak, which can be subjective, sub suggestive of musical possibilities, built-in character structures, which can be suggestive of musical possibilities, are actually very similar to those of Berlioz and his claims that poor feminine oboes are unsuited to virtuosity, not because of their limited keys, but because of the ineffable character that suffuses them. A 2014 orchestration manual called the Idiomatic Orchestra similarly discusses at length the relationship between what is said and how it is said, arguing that, quote, only through the appearance of something, be it music, people, or something else, can we gain access to its essence, the appearance here being the instruments used. 20th century musicians, as we have already seen, unabashedly treated certain instruments as feminine. In 1977, oboist Leon Goussens wrote, the oboe is a lady. If we lose her feminine qualities, we neutralize the sound which thousands of years of history have sought to sustain and beautify. Despite his conviction, this is a demonstrably false statement, as I have shown. I recently encountered an Italian oboist on, posting on Instagram that he wished only that oboe were a feminine noun. It in fact takes eel in Italian. More subtly, a review from 2000 of oboist Jan Hikwak's recording of five Pasquale pieces remarks that this extraordinary young woman doesn't pass out is truly a miracle. This is certainly gentler in its problematic association than an assertion that the bassoon can only be played by a strong man, but it does recall entrenched concerns over the oboe's suitability for women. Compare this to a 2013 description of male oboist Francois Leleu playing Pasquale. His virtuosity is limitless and flows so naturally from its source that one is no longer aware of all the hard work that preceded it. And this 2018 review of clarinist Martin Frost that initially focuses on his lanky build and physical agility. I challenge you to consider whether you can realistically imagine a review, even in 2021, which concludes that this extraordinary young man doesn't pass out is truly a miracle.
Thank you very much.